everybody once again. My name is Joseph Nyagari, part of the Gatsby Africa Textile and Apparel team. And uh, today's webinar has been organized by ourselves, Gatsby Africa, in collaboration with Next Table. In order to set the stage, it is my sincere pleasure to invite the program director for Textile and Apparel. Miss Antoinette Tesha to kick us off, and then I will come back. You. Thank you, Joseph, and good morning, everyone. Um, absolute pleasure to have you here in what is a second of a series of webinars that we have organized to share with you the opportunities in the circular uh, textiles um, universe. So you recall two weeks ago, we had another webinar which was looking at really agri-waste and turning agri-waste into gold and particularly fiber. And today we want to advance that conversation further and really get uh, into practical um, illustrations of how this can be done. So just to give you a bit of a background about who we are for those who are joining us for the first time. Um, so we are, we are a textile and apparel program under an organization called Gatsby Africa. We're a private foundation uh, funded by Lord Sainsbury's out of the UK. We have a strong focus in East Africa. So we've been operating in the region for over 30 years in various different industries. And at present, we have a quite a diverse portfolio around aimed at strategic uh, value chains that uh, within which East Africa has a comparative advantage. So textile and apparel is one of the segments, I mean, one of our portfolio sectors, and the team today will be taking you through what the work that we do and why we do it. Uh, we're a funder implementer, so we, we, we fund ourselves, we, we self-funded, we fund others, and then we support others through partnerships. And uh, we have over 150 staff in the East Africa region. So ultimately, we aim to build stronger and more inclusive economies and uh, advance the generation of jobs as well as better incomes in the region. So the Textile and Apparel program focuses on four key intervention areas. The first being investment attraction in which we help international investors find a home in East Africa. And that also includes uh, working closely with other partners to deliver the right type of industrial infrastructure required for success. Uh, we do quite a lot of business linkages uh, to trying to link existing value actors, uh, value chain actors with others, both domestic and internationally, primarily to try and build as much verticality as possible into the region. We have a strong uh, and then quite a long uh, program around technical assistance to factories where we work with existing factories to make them, to help them to become more efficient and export ready. And ultimately it is our sincere passion to position East Africa as the next green innovative and responsible manufacturing hub for the textile and apparel sector. Um, I've already spoken about regional verticality. So we operate across Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya uh, with, a, with a desire to expand further with, where the opportunity takes us. And ultimately, we really want to build a best in class, socially and environmentally responsible textile and garment hub here in East Africa. So today we're really getting into green manufacturing, which is one of the pillars of our program. And uh, part of it looks at uh, exploring other nat natural fibers that can be used for textiles and garments. Um, not just for clothing, but also for industrial or manufacturing or even for home textiles. And uh, this is part of our wider circular textiles initiatives. So some of the other work we do in this space is looking at uh, zero liquid discharge and solutions for saving water. As you know, the textile and apparel uh, industry is quite heavy on water usage. Uh, we're also uh, exploring dyeing technologies and making them more efficient and uh, also recycling. Uh, we have a program aligned to PET plastics to textiles, leveraging on existing waste. And then um, looking at alternative fibers, which we're deep diving today. And then really looking at how do we create better efficiency across the value chain and build an industry or support the building of an industry that is future proof. 
So with those few words, um, I want to hand over to my co-host this morning, Joseph, to take us further. But um, I'll be here to take any questions related to Gatsby, and I hope you'll enjoy this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antoinette, for that uh, introduction. I will then uh, now proceed to introduce the next uh, speaker. Before then, I'll just uh, highlight uh, two things. First is, this is the second part webinar. Some of you may have attended our first part, which was on the 23rd of uh, August. And uh, in that one, that webinar, we covered a broad, you know, it was, it was very broad on various alternative fibers and their potential for textiles. But today's uh, webinar is very specific on pineapple. And we are very uh, happy to have a partnership with Nextevo. As uh, Antoinette has indicated, um, it's all about pushing for circularity and sustainability, and these are the efforts I lead in our program. And if we look at the trends that are taking place in the fashion space, you will find that many brands who give business to textile companies are in setting very specific targets on circularity. This is a growing trend. And that's very important to keep an eye on. Um, secondly, there is a strong push towards fiber to fiber recycling technologies. What that means is you're able to start from fiber and go back to fiber again. And there are a lot of innovations going on in this particular space. There's also a push to reduce fast fashion and move back to slow fashion. The world has realized fast fashion has come at a very big cost, especially the environment. And now this is opening up a lot of innovations, more specifically, which is connected to our uh, webinar today. There is a lot of debates between man-made versus natural fibers. <clears throat> man-made fibers, for example, polyester is currently dominating uh, the textile and fashion industry. Um, it was, it's not going anywhere anytime soon, but you know, the talk is how can it be done in a more sustainable way? At the same time, there's a growing push, you know, how can we, you know, put more effort on natural fibers? Um, cotton is the dominant natural fiber, but there's a growing trend to look at alternatives. Why? It's because of some of the impacts, negative impacts uh, on the cotton side. So it's opening up new opportunities. And today is one of those days when we shall delve into one of those natural fibers, which is an alternative to cotton. At the same time, there is efforts on upscaling textile waste, what was considered waste now to be considered as raw material. So there are a lot of innovations in this space. And then we still have you know, repair and reuse models, various models of repairing and reuse just to increase the life cycle of the textile product. So this is just to give you an overview of some of the trends that we're keeping a track on. And that is what led us to um, do our research and get to connect with the uh, next table. It's my sincere pleasure to introduce the speaker who is going to uh, take us through this session, Mr. Harold uh, Koh, who is the founder and CEO of Next table. He has over 21 years of senior leadership experience uh, in diverse industries in the Asia Pacific um, region covering agriculture, load handling, and automobiles. He has served for nine years as the president and director of the you know, uh, Great Giant Apple. This is a really big uh, uh, agri-production company and the, the, the world's second largest uh, pineapple producer based in Indonesia. He, he left this company to start his own uh, sustainable agriculture by product venture. So within Nextevo, he is able to carry all this wealth of experience and has been able to build a brand of vertically integrated operation from farming all the way to export, touching uh, more than 60 countries globally. We are extremely lucky to uh, connect with him and we believe this is an opportunity for him to share his experience, to share his knowledge. And more specifically, he has a keen interest to build connections uh, within East Africa to grow his wide network. 
And we are hoping these conversations and to the players who are here today will find it useful to build these connections. As Gatsby Africa, we are here to support any connections possible. Thank you. It's my opportunity, sincere pleasure to now uh, hand over the baton to Harold to take it up from here. Welcome, Harold. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Thanks for the, all the kind words that you, you made about me. Um, okay, for the start, let me try to share my screen here. Um, hmm. Sorry, Harold, before you start, uh, I'd just like to welcome the attendees that if there's any questions, as Harold makes his presentation, please drop them into the chat. Uh, if the chat is not enabled, we'll enable it shortly. And uh, we'll be tra tracking questions as they go and hoping to answer them at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks. Well, uh, thanks for coming for your second series of the, uh, you know, we got talking about the uh, ways as well as the natural fiber. For today's uh, topic, it's more towards the agricultural waste, specifically uh, in regards to uh, pineapple leaf fibers. Well, as you can see from the slide here, right, everyone knows uh, climate change is a real issue. And uh, and you're going to get worse in spite of a lot of things that has been uh, going on to try to reduce the, uh, the temperature, the outcome, the activities. To reduce the uh, to make the world a better place. Right. On the other hand, uh, we believe that uh, companies that are into this area of sustainability has a good opportunity not just to uh, make the world a better place, but also create opportunities for businesses. So we can also build a good business, a positive business out of helping to make the world a better place. Um, for next level, we are very important in two areas. Number one, we look at the environmental impact as well as the social impact. Okay. Well, uh, I don't have to explain about myself. Uh, Joseph had talked a lot about me uh, just now. So I'm going to skip this slide. Um, so what's about next level? Um, next level was founded in June 2019. And uh, you know, in Singapore, and currently we're operating out of Thailand and Indonesia. Very soon, in about a few months' time, we'll start an operation in Philippines as well as in uh, Vietnam. And uh, I don't, I don't really have a job or our mission when we first started. We like to transform agriculture waste, now including the natural fiber scale in Southeast Asia country, and try to make it into a sustainable added value for us or you know, from materials to the products. Well, having said this, you know, over the last six months, we uh, start to explore in other countries, other continents, and we got to know about East Africa. So uh, we went to East Africa in February this year, and we talked to a number of uh, potential uh, farmers, potential uh, industrial farming in terms of uh, uh, sales house. And uh, we thought there's a great opportunity to do something in East Africa. Yeah. And of course, we, meet, uh, we met uh, Gatsby during the trip, and thanks uh, now for doing this uh, webinar. So what is our three businesses that we do in Nextivo? The first one is sustainable textile and fashion. Uh, the second one is the bioplastic, and the third one is the biomass. Uh, it's quite interesting here. Uh, why do we start with the bioplastic? So when we work, with the sustainable pineapple leaf fiber, all the uh, decortication, we extract the uh, fiber from the leaf. But when we extract the fiber from the leaf, they have green residues left behind. So when we want to give the green residue to the uh, to the farmers for free, and it's actually very good for the land, well, it's used as a compost. Uh, farmers rejected it because they uh, they said that it cost them money to load it, and it also cost them. Uh, um, sorry. sorry. Yeah, sorry, uh, this interrupting. And uh, the farmers um 
they don't want it because it costs them money to uh, even to plant it. Then we have a problem. So what's our problem? Our problem is how are we going to get rid of this uh, biodiversity? We didn't want to landfill it. As a zero waste company, we try to find a home for this green industry. And as a result, the bioplastic was sunk. So we're going to make the green residue as a filler. We mix it with polylactic acid to make bioplastics. But to this topic, we are not talking about bioplastic. To this topic, it's going to talk about the uh, sustainable textile fashion, uh, specifically on the uh, pineapple leaf fibre. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, hi, guys. Can you hear me? Um, it's much better, Harold. Thank you. You were not very clear earlier. Oh, Thank okay. You. I think it could be the mic. Maybe I'll send you the mic. Then. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry. Uh, no, no, no. Just, uh, can you hear me now? Very clear. Yeah. Much better. Okay, that's good. Uh, that's better. Yeah, okay. I think it's the mic issue. Uh, okay. Um, well, in this slide, you know, as you can see here, one is a plant-based natural fibers. And there are basically uh, six types of non-wood biofibers. Um, in this, in over this six here is uh, their stem, trunks, straw, bars, leaf, seeds, slash fruit, and grass. And uh, there's so many different kinds all over the world, not just in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in North, uh, in Europe, in, uh, in, in America, in the North and South America. Now, the question is about which type of fibers that are good that can be cultivated at scale to be used for uh, sustainable textiles. If you look at this slide here, right, we all know that the, uh, the market demand is going up for the uh, plant-based uh, natural fiber. And this statistics, there's so many statistics, you know, if you go to the internet and you can probably find at least 10 of them, everyone, they may show the different numbers, but everyone show a growth in this, um, in this uh, natural fiber market. And for this one, you can see that the growth is expected to be at a compounded rate of 5.5% annually from 4.5 billion to uh, 6.8 billion by 2029. All right. But if you really look deep into it, Natural fiber, excluding the uh, cotton, excluding the synthetic fiber, is excluding all the others. Natural fiber only has 6% of the entire global fiber market in the world. And 6% is relatively small. And then if you go deep into it and look at it and say, okay, what is this 6%? Who are these? The jute is the biggest. Coconut koi is a sec uh, is a second. And flax, which is used for linen, is a uh, number three. And then number four, that's where Cesar, Capo, Remy, including pineapple, are in part of the others. See, the word pineapple was not even mentioned here when I, you know, collect the statistics. It probably be uh, even less than Remy and less than uh, Cesar. All right, now the, the question here is this. In order for us to use more natural fiber, it is not about marketing or branding only. It is also about the availability of the source. Where can you get this in scalable way so that we can produce it and able to market it, you know, not just regionally, but also globally. Uh, sustainability, you know, is something that everyone likes to talk about nowadays. This is a buzzword everywhere you go, you know, in any countries, governments, companies, consumers, they all talk about sustainability. But if you talk about sustainability to do a business, right, in a business, sustainability is only four, one out of four factors that will drive the success. This is very important, right? If you just talk about sustainability alone, it's not going to be successful. So sustainability, yes, is one, it's very important, but you also need to be scalable. So we need to find products that are scalable. For example, CESA in East Africa, if we are able to work with the CESA, then is you know, with a few companies that are producing this, so with the farmers, then we're able to get big scalable amount to start using CESA fiber for the uh, sustainable textile and fashion. Right. And functionality is also important. 
For example, pineapple leaf fiber. Is it breathable? How good is the car moisture car retention? If somebody wear this and then you go out and then you know when you sweat and it's not able to retain moisture, then it may not be a good thing to wear the uh, pineapple fiber uh, uh, fabrics. All right, it's doable. And of course, you know, for the pineapple, it's also antibacterial property. It has antibacterial properties. And that actually helps a person use the uh, pineapple leaf fiber. The last thing, it must be marketable. Right? We have to work with the brands. The brands must be able to position the product. Right? And uh, design innovation here. How are you going to design the products and make people attracted to it? Not just sustainability story, but also a story of... Uh, of making it you know attractive for people to wear it acceptable pricing should we price it at a premium or should we price it to the mass market how are we going to position the price in, uh, in regards to the product itself but it's also pretty much related to the brand and also pretty much related to the type of natural fiber and cost efficiency is extremely important at the end of the day all the companies in the world you know they are profit center yes they like to do sustainability uh, programs uh, which is very important, but if they are not profitable, they are not sustainable themselves. Eventually, they have to be gone, right? So, so the thing is that it has to be profitable to keep them alive and to continue to do the sustainable activities that they need to do. This is actually quite interesting here. Why we choose pineapple as a start? Well, beside me, I've been spending nine years as a CEO on the world's second largest pineapple plantation, which I have a lot of backgrounds in pineapple. But really, pineapple... Is uh is such a popular fruit, you know. It symbolizes a lot of things. You know, in Asia, it, talk, it symbolizes wealth, good luck, and in Western countries, it symbolizes uh something that is nice for good home decos and drinks that people love. Uh, where the people like to pull up, uh, you know, wearing the uh, the pineapple clothings in you know in the Western world, and it's also associated with fruits, drinks, uh, and if you look at this slide here. Singapore last Friday just elected the new president, and the new president actually uses a pineapple as a symbol. Uh, not to mention about Singapore, even the Prime Minister of Japan uh, also talk about pineapple, and so as the uh, President Chai from uh, from Taiwan. So uh, the uh, you know all the head of states all talk about pineapple. So it's like pineapple is some kind of symbol for success. And because of this popularity, you know, it was easy to create excitement in sustainable pineapple textiles and fashions. Okay, the topics today, uh, I'd like to zoom in a little bit into uh, scalability and partnering with the farmers. And uh, how do we work with the farmers group, cooperative, and in fact, also with the government. So I'd like to share the experience with the, the folks in East Africa and to see whether, you know, can we actually look into this and uh, work in a similar ways to make this happen. Next Evo works in three different ways with the farmers. Right? And this is not including industrial farming. Next Evo also works with industrial farmers, uh, which is like big groups of companies uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, but today, this is not the topic. The topic here is focus more on how to work with the individual small farmers. So the one alternative or the first alternative is that we work with farmers group. It's very difficult to work with one individual because they do not own a big farm. And, and uh, we, we work with the groups or sometimes you call it cooperative. But in many occasions, we cannot find cooperative in many of these countries, uh, but they do have farmers groups that work together. So what we do is very simple for this case. We actually source a pineapple leaf from them and we do our own decortication. So this is one way, the easiest way, right? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, number two, if we work with them, uh, where the farmer's group will do the decortication, what we'll do is we will train them and then we sign an off-take agreement with them. Basically what it means is, you know, they collect the leaf, they do the uh, the decortication, or, or we call it the extraction of the pineapple leaf fiber, and then we do the offtakes from them. And, uh, and number three, which is uh, we have an example on how we do it on a tri collaboration, um, basically with the farmers group and the local government and us. Right. So what the local government do? Uh, this is very important. The local government actually organize a farmer to form the groups. 
and uh, they also find us find some training funds so that they can bring uh, trainers to train the farmers. And they also work with cooperation uh, to contribute uh, the corticating machine to the farmers to their CSR programs. And the farmer has the equipment so they can actually do it. Right. So these are the three ways that we work with. But of course, there's one very important thing here I want to say. Uh, next level practices fair trade. We do not pay uh, farmers or pay for the products for some benefits that uh, that is not equal for the farmers. Right? Because the uh, social impact is part of our core values and, uh, and we practice the fair trade. Uh, in addition to this, we also work with three uh, uh, big corporations. Uh, they have uh, industrial farming for pineapples. Uh, the reason that we need to work with them is also because we need to be scalable. Uh, working with farmers is good, but the uh, scale from the farmer sometimes is not as big. And uh, But on the other hand, we need to work with both industrial farming as well as farmer groups. Uh, this is the map of Southeast Asia, and you can see that there are five countries stated there. Singapore is where we base. Uh, we do have operation in Indonesia and Thailand at this moment. In about a few months' time, uh, we will enter the Philippines as well as in Vietnam. And the uh, but why Southeast Asia? Uh, besides me being living in this part of the world, um, Southeast Asia today is the world largest pineapple producer. If you group Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand together, you know, by far, they have about 6 million metric tons of pineapples a year. And, um, and what we are trying to do at this moment is we are trying to establish a, a factory in Vietnam. A factory that we can do the, uh, the gumming or the call it mechanical processing. So what happened is this, when you uh, when we decorticated the pineapple leaf, take the fiber, the fiber needs to go to the second stage. The second stage is to do a clean up and also opening of the fiber and also cutting. Uh, that is, after you do for this second stage, the third stage will be going for the spinning. So the second stage will be all concentrated in Vietnam. So we'll bring the, uh, the uh, really, uh, what do you call it, the... Uh, pineapple leaf fibers, or we call it dry path, uh, from Thailand, Indonesia, and Philippines, and ship it to Vietnam. And we also be working with the Vietnam farmers to produce the uh, dry path and, uh, and all centering around Vietnam. Now, the question is why Vietnam? Today, Vietnam is the world's third largest uh, textile exporters. And um, they have full chain of, you know, a very deep vertically integrated, including horizontal integrated, uh, supply chain on the textiles. So they have a lot of spinners there. There are plenty of uh, fabric makers, garment makers, even including uh, footwares, uh, not just for apparels and upholsteries and all kinds of things that use the textiles are all based out of Vietnam. Right. Um, okay, this map uh, this slide here is to show you that we today are honoring uh, 13 farmer groups in Thailand and Indonesia. Uh, if we include uh, Philippines, you'll be 14. Um, in, uh, in Indonesia, today we have 10 locations. 10 locations of uh, farmers group in uh, seven areas that we are working on. In, uh, in Thailand, uh, Currently, we have three locations that we work with the farmers. And uh, in Philippines, we just started doing a trial run in uh, as we speak today. Okay, I just want to show you uh, some of the slides that we have here in uh, different places. Um, West Java, uh, we actually involve about 120 farmers uh, in this program. Uh, There's a group of guys. Uh, they are also farmers themselves. They will collect from individual farmers. And they bring it to center place, a central area where they can do the decortication, and they and we off take the uh, dry path from them, or we call it dry pineapple leaf fibers. 
Uh, in this slide, we actually showed you that we are working with the local government. Actually, this is very interesting. The mayor of Prabhupada uh, of Indonesia, he actually found us. We didn't find them. They found us. They paid a visit to us. Uh, and the objective is to see whether we can work with them to help the uh, local farmers and uh, help them to learn how to harvest the leaf, how to decorticate the leaf, and then offtake off -take the leaf from the, uh, offtake the fiber from the farmers. So the mayor brought about six or seven people from the uh, from the province to come to uh, to visit us. And we have a real big discussion in regards to this. And one month later, uh, we visited the, uh, the, the, the town of Pababuli and uh, and uh, the mayor actually personally bring us along uh, around the whole area to look at all the farms, to look at the uh, the farmers group and how we're going to work with them. Okay, there's another area in the South Sumatra, Indonesia, where the uh, the farmers are doing the uh, uh, extraction of the pineapple leaf uh, by showing the equipment that they have and how they do it. And you can see that right, there's so much uh, green residues that actually uh, stuck there in the slide, you know, in this one. And uh, this this is the one that we're going to use it for our bioplastic. If not, this will all go to waste. Okay, this slide here I'll show is uh, is in Ranchaburi. Ranchaburi is in uh, Thailand. It's the western part of Thailand. Um, this group of... Uh, Farmers actually they source for all the other farmers. They bring all the leaf together and they do the decortication and do the drying, and we off take all the uh, products that they make. Uh, Rayong is in the East Thailand. Uh, in this area, we work slightly more than work slightly with more than two hundred farmers uh, involved in this program, and the. Um, so the farmers, the other farmers, uh, who have a group of people, they involve in harvesting of the pineapple leaf after they finish harvesting the uh, pineapple. And in Rayong, we have our own decorticating uh, facility. Uh, so what they do is that they bring all this uh, leaf to our location, and uh, these are our our employees, uh, you know, doing the decortication of the uh, pineapple leaf to become a fiber. And then we do sun dry. Uh, we do not want to use any uh, fossil fuel heating to dry the fiber because uh, we try not to use anything that's fossil fuel. So natural drying uh, is also pretty good for us because it's more sustainable. And in this whole process, we do not use any single chemical. So it's zero chemical. Well, as we speak now, uh, a group of us actually in uh, in Philippines, and uh, we are we are doing a trial um, harvesting. Uh, we are testing in one of the uh, industrial farms, uh, and uh, the reason we need to test is because uh, the people there in this 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 area, especially, uh, they have not done it before, and we want to ensure that before we start the operation, uh, they have been well trained on how to harvest it, how to pack it, and how to deliver it to our central location so that we can do the decortication. Now, so, you know, we show you a lot of slides and all the great stuff. So the thing is, uh, what are the challenges that are faced uh, at a sourcing level? I think this is very important because when we work with the farmers, um, we, you know, we will not say that we everything is perfect. We do have other challenges too. Uh, the main one is that you know we do have a customer to sell our products to, and uh, we need to ensure that all the supply that comes from the farmer must be, you know, up to the quality that is acceptable to us, and the supply has to be consistent. So we work across all the region with the farmers group with the uh, decorticators to ensure that the supply has to be consistently giving to us, you know, and on top of that, the quality must be guaranteed by them because if not, our customer will reject the uh, pineapple leaf fiber from us. And uh, 
The second thing, as we all know, right, this is uh, agriculture. Agriculture has a big risk in regards to uh, climate. Uh, El Nino, La Nina, and these are the famous names here. You know, El Nino, when you come to El Nino, there'll be droughts. La Nina with heavy rains and flooded, you know, floods become a common things. So these are the risks that we are working with. And obviously, um, you cannot uh, escape this forever. In sometimes they're good, but sometimes they're really bad. So the important thing for us as a company, we do have diverse sources, meaning that we source from Northern Hemisphere and we also source from country in the Southern Hemisphere. What's the meaning of Northern and Southern? Means that Northern Hemisphere means it's above the equator. The Southern Hemisphere is below the equator. And uh, climates are different between the North and the South. Even the uh, consistency in terms of in terms of rain, in terms of the climate change are also different. So uh, we do work with the farmers in this area too. We also hope that the farmers will not get into trouble with the droughts. As a result, you know, they have no fruits, and not to mention there's no leaf for us to harm. Right? The, uh, the third one is really the imbalance of a uh, cost versus market pricing. Um, you know, we uh, we work on fair trade. And uh, and sometimes uh, this is actually quite interesting. Different countries have different selling prices, uh, but it's quite consistently know that countries that sell at a higher price, their quality are also more consistent. Country that we are have the lower price, the uh, the quality sometimes are not consistent, and the supplies are also not consistent. So we this is so we have to work harder in those countries that are not uh, so consistent to, to help the farmers out to, to how to improve their productivities. And uh, and to the farmers, it's very important. Increased productivity means increase the, uh, increase the profit. And the farmers have no reason to say that, you know, they are not interested to uh, increase their productivity. So, so far, it's so good. Uh, they are quite uh, happy uh, to work together with us and we are happy to work together with them on this thing. Right. Uh, one, one, uh, one of the biggest challenges that we find in many countries is that farmers group or even cooperative, they may not have money or they cannot even afford buy decorticating machines. So when there's not enough decorticating machines, you know, one farmers group may only have three and three is not enough to produce sufficient volume for us. And you know what? Their capacity, they can even produce up, they can even use up to 10 decorticator machines because they have a lot of pineapple leaf fibers. But because there's no ability to, uh, to buy those, uh, it becomes a challenge for them, which means that's a challenge for us. And uh, that's why the involvement of the government, the local government is very good. The local government uh, sometimes uh, ask to the, com the big companies, you know, that has branches in the area, to do some CSR activities to help out the farmers. And some of the companies actually help the farmers by contributing some uh, or well, a few decorticating machines for them. Right. So one of the biggest challenge for, for, for us uh, in next demo uh, is about certification. In today's world, right, there's no such thing saying that we are green and everyone will believe in you because the word greenwashing is a very common term used in the world right now. And sometimes they even use it wrongly. You know, on companies that are actually not greenwashing, but that's been termed as a greenwashing. And uh, in order to uh, to do a proper, sustainable uh, textile and fashion uh, companies, we, we need to get our product traced. We need to be trace certified. Basically, traceability is very important to us. And then we also need to do a full life cycle assessment. And you know what? The full life cycle assessment cost is extremely high. Just to get a certification, it costs about eighty thousand US dollar. So sometimes we also wonder, you know, um, the cost is so prohibitive and it's so difficult to uh, to do this. Uh, how can the farmers and uh, a startup company like us be able to afford to do a LCA when the cost is so high? But LCA is required because our customers will not buy the products from us without the LCA certification. So these are all the challenges that, you know, a company like us face. But on the other hand, it's also the challenge that the farmers equally face with us. But the good news is that most of the things that I mentioned here, 
can be addressed. So the next slide here I'd like to show is the whole process of the entire value chain, right? Uh, you've seen on the slide of how the farmer uh, harvests, how the farmer do the decortication and drying process. And after that, what's next? The next part is to do the RTS processing. I mentioned earlier, really uh, earlier about RTS processing. This is basically ready to spin. Uh, we need to make the fiber into a cottonized form so they can be ready to spin before you go to the next step for spinning. And uh, so what next thing we'll do is that after the spinning, we actually sell the ready to spin products. I'll come back to the facility later. And or we uh, go for, uh, we, uh, sorry, sorry, we, we sell the ready to spin after we do the, uh, the mechanical processing. And then we sell the product. And or we go to the next step, we actually go to spinning and make into a blended yarn. So we blend our yarn with a few things, right? We can blend it with uh, some uh, organic cotton, uh, recycled PET, and things like this. And uh, and then we sell it as a yarn. Or the next stage, we appoint an OEM, which is the fabric maker, to make it into fabrics. So uh, the fabrics are denim, knitted, canvas, depends on what you want it to need to. And after this, uh, you will go to the next step, which is the garment factory, where the garment factory will produce the finished products for the end customer or for the brands. So what is this uh, RTS processing facility? This is the one that I mentioned that we're going to establish one in Vietnam. Um, RTS processing facility is a mechanical processing or degumming process that we take out the gum from the uh, fiber. We also open up the, the fiber uh, so they can be going for spinning and we cut it into pieces like uh, to make it a cottonized form. And uh, and this process uh, needs to be done. If not, you cannot do it, right? So this whole entire process here in uh, that I talk about in Vietnam can also be a model. This can also be a model used in East Africa. All right. Of course, East Africa's uh, challenges uh, will have maybe different from the challenges that we face in Southeast Asia. Uh, but I'm sure you know we can talk about those in details, but not in so much in this uh, in this uh, in this presentation today. So when the products are done, uh, you know for next level we uh, focus on four segments. One segment is the footwear, right? the second is apparel, and in the apparel area, apparel is very huge, right? We are more into denim. Uh, we think the name is uh, you know is very important for us. Uh, you know we're working more on the name. Uh, we're also working on Jesse. We're also working on uh, on other uh, our fabric products, right? but mainly on the name at this moment. Accessories are things like the top bag or canvas bag and you know, the bag studies. Uh, we do home textiles like like the uh, you can see from here the towers, the bath towers, even the bath robes. And we do our upholsteries, uh, also curtains, carpets, or rugs. So these are all uh, what we show you here. It's not all the customer we have. Uh, a few of them, yes, but uh, we actually work with a number of these customers that you've seen in these uh, photos. Well, I think I finished my this is my last slide, and uh, that's all my presentation. Uh, Okay, let's look at, uh, I'm sure there are quite a number of questions here. I think there are nine Q&A questions and... Uh... Yes, thank you. Uh, Harold will help you uh, highlight some of the questions that you can respond. Okay. Um, some people have uh, typed in the questions and I believe if you would like to also um, unmute, we will now also allow that session, maybe somebody may want to ask the question. So that is also going to be allowed. So between myself and the internet, you can pick some questions, internet. Yes, uh, let me start you with Francisca Odundo, who has several questions uh, on the Q&A chat. Um, the first one is, what is currently of higher value to the farmer, the pineapple or the fiber? The uh, the fruits 
this definitely have a higher value. And uh, the, fi the, 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 the fiber is less. But the point here is, you know, many farms in the world today, they harvest the fruits and they throw away the, the leaf. They don't do anything with the pineapple leaf. And uh, so the, the idea here is, if they can cultivate and harvest the leaf, they will generate extra income for the farmers. So it's, it's always good to have an incremental income on the products that you use to throw away. Oh, so, yeah. Okay, I think uh, to continue with Franz Francesca, um, talking about the sun drying, where you indicated is what is utilized here. So the question is, how does how often does adverse weather stop the drying of fiber and does it sabotage operations? You know, this is a very interesting question. And uh, we, we actually experienced this before. I experienced this really, really experienced in the Southeast Asia, especially Thailand and Indonesia. Thailand and Indonesia is a tropical country. So when we bring the, uh, when we do this sun drying, and in these countries, it rains a lot. And suddenly it rains like five minutes, it stops. It stops for three hours and it rains again. <laughs> and uh, imagine when you put it there for sun drying, and uh, sometimes it rains like two times a day. So you're going to run in and out to carry those uh, pineapple fiber, you know, for shelter and then bring it out to the sun again. So it is a very non-productive activities, right? So, the, so what we learned from here is that we're going to build a, some kind of greenhouse where the heat can be absorbed from the sun and it can dry the pineapple fiber in the kind of uh, greenhouse. So the uh, we uh, we have not come up with a proper name for that yet, but the, the, the functionality and the, the shape that we look at is more like a greenhouse. Uh, we are planning to do this in about two to three months' time. We actually have a drawing for that already. And that will actually help us to avoid, you know, for being wet by the wind. Um, so interestingly, Harold, actually, we've come across a, a similar process in, I think it was in Uganda, where they use mm -hmm. heat from waste um, to, to dry the leaves. But I guess that's a different model that can also be explored. Um, I'm hoping the champion of that is also on the call. Um, there's a there's a question that's been asked by several attendees, which I think is quite important, um, and that is about the type of pineapple that you actually use. So the the genetic, I, I guess, is asking around the the, the genetic uh, type of pineapple, and then um, whether the length of the of the pineapple leaf um, makes a difference. Because I think there's a few of the comments where. The, the ones that you had in your presentation look very large, and we're not sure if in East Africa we have leaves of that size. Um, so please, can you address that? Yeah, um, there are many different type of pineapple varieties in the world. The uh, the three common ones that have been growing, um, you know, around the world, is the MD two, the smooth cayenne, as well as the Queen's variety. And the um, and in some other specific places like in India, they have their own specific uh, variety, and so is in Malaysia, right? So there are so many different types, but there's one thing for sure that um, the uh, the size of the leaf may cost because of the variety, but it also may cost because of the uh, farming condition in that country. I saw some MD2 farm in uh, in Kenya, but the leaf is very short. But in the same the same MD2 farm in Costa Rica, the leaf is very long. Or farm in Indonesia or even in Philippines. So the uh the is is uh, I think is is a question of the uh, the location. Uh, it may got to do with uh with the dryness in the area. Um, even though they say pineapple can withstand uh, droughts, but uh, if you give them more water, the leaf will be greener. But come back to the fiber, will that affect the fiber? I think the answer is somewhat yes. But on the other hand, on the other hand, um, shorter fiber will give 
It's a little bit more challenge just to make more, 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 uh, no, shorter leaf, excuse me. Shorter leaf will give more challenges to make more fiber. Uh, that, that, that is true. But different varieties so far we see uh, have very little impact at this moment, right? I hope I answered the question. Okay. Um, uh, there are many questions from Francesca, but I'll just highlight one more. Um, whereby uh, Francesca would like to know, have you done a comparative uh, analysis between uh, pineapple fiber and other natural fibers? So how do they compare? Uh, yes, the, uh, the number of functionality of the fibers that we test. Um, okay, since this uh, East Africa thing, I will talk about CESA. CESA versus pineapple. One of the things uh, CESA have is that the strength is actually slightly stronger than a pineapple. But on the other hand, the uh, CESA moisture absorption is actually not as good as pineapple leaf fiber. We do have a, a list of comparison of the strength, of the uh, of the uh, the function the, oh, the whole list of functionalities yes we do so that's why it does not mean that CSI is bad it doesn't mean that pineapple is better what it means is that if we are able to blend them together to utilize the strength of each each of these fiber you make up a very good fabrics. Okay, um, so we have a lot of comments and questions from Mr. Edward Sekayiba, uh, who wants to understand, I think they'll pick one, which is regarding certification. So a lot of the pineapples that are grown in the region um, are grown mainly organically. And uh, what type of certification would they require? And are there service providers that you could uh, recommend who can help to certify uh, pineapples? There was also an additional question from Madame Francisca, which was around the use of chemicals in the pineapples and whether uh, that would also, I would like to know that that would affect the certification process. Yeah, the um, uh, organic pineapples, um, yes, you need to go through a certification to claim that the product is organic. And uh, just to let you know that the uh, uh, what is organically certified in US is not is different from what is certified for Europe. Europe has a stronger, a uh, more more strict method of certification. They they have more requirements basically compared to America. So if you ask me, answer is yes. You need to certify it. If not, you cannot uh, put a label called organic. Um, you, uh, the second question uh, you ask is about chemical. Um, most of the farms, in order to increase the yield of the uh, products, not just pineapple, anything, you know, uh, it is quite common to use uh, chemical fertilizer. And we all know that the long usage or the frequent usage of chemical fertilizer is actually very bad uh, for the soil. And it will actually create problems for the future where the soils are not good, uh, will become basically infertile you know, to grow products anymore. And there are more and more um, in today's world, more and more people understand that you know, organic compost is becoming very important. We use a mix in the soil. I doubt that the whole world will change to non-chemical uh, because I think the world still need food to be in the need food to feed them. And uh, if we change to 100 percent non-chemical, I think it will not maybe maybe it will not be enough to feed the world. All right. But I think the important thing here is that more and more people realize to use less chemical. So over a period of time, uh, hopefully one day, uh, not much chemical will be used. Uh, for growing, but I doubt, I really doubt that we can take 100% of the chemical because uh, it actually create high yield for the products. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's one more question. I think it's actually been asked by two people, so I'll try and aggregate it as one question. And it's around uh, most producers in East Africa are cottage industries. 
And uh, yeah. the other one is also talking about farmers and small farmer organization. Is there a way to create a platform to aggregate the fiber from producers uh, to meet minimum supply quantities? And the other one is how can Nextevo collaborate with farmer organization to be able to help them to export uh, pineapple leaf? Uh, do, there is no standard platform at this moment uh, to organize this. Um, but I'm pretty sure, you know, there will be a way to do this. I I came across with some, uh, some startups in Indonesia where they actually uh, create a, a software platform to work with the farmers on, on, on how to how to harvest, how to grow the fruits, how to harvest the fruits and calculating the yield and things like this, which can be used for, for the leaf. And of course, today, right? Uh, pineapple, you grow pineapple not because of the leaf. You grow pineapple because of the fruits. But the leaf will give an opportunity to the farmer to generate extra income, to use something that you throw away to generate some extra income. In addition to that, you also give an environmental uh, uh, impact to the products that we are going to use. Instead of using 100% cotton or 100% polyester, you can actually mix with the pineapple fiber. And that would give a better uh, environment uh, for the user to use the new the, the end products, right? The, the finished products. So there's an impact of both social as well as environmental. And uh, and why is that so? Because uh, when you use pineapple leaf fiber, there's no additional fertilizer is required. There's no further uh, no additional water is required because you you use the water and fertilizer for the fruits. So the leaves are really, really a, a, a residue, or uh, really a, the, the, to help. The leaf is there to, to absorb the photosynthesis, to let the plant grow and then grow the fruits. And the purpose is over once the fruit is harvested. Right. But now we can even use the leaf. And that means that farmers make extra income and, uh, and it's better for the environment. So there are, these are the two very important things that why we use the pineapple leaf fiber. And the pineapple fiber can also be good functional uh, uh, for the people who use it and wear it. Right. So I think these are the, the important things. Right. Uh, come back to the question, yes. Uh, they will, yes, it just, it's, it's possible to establish a platform uh, to work you know, with the farmers. Uh, number two, you asked a question on uh, how to work with the farmers in, to, to establish the, the farmers group. That's what your question is. Uh, I'm not sure the second question. Um, yeah, I think the one was whether you you next level would be able to work with pharma communities to help them to start exporting pineapple leaf. Uh, yes, I think um, the the that's what we do in uh, Indonesia. That's what we do in uh, in Philippines. Uh, no, not in Philippines. Sorry, in Thailand. Philippines, we work with the industrial group. So in Thailand and in Indonesia, that's what we do. And uh, but for us. Uh, East Africa is a bit far away, but we need to collaborate with someone who are willing to work with us to make this happen. It's, it's not impossible. It's definitely possible. It's just at a distance that we need to work with someone who are, who are willing to do this together with us in East Africa to make it happen. And I think that's actually the purpose of having this webinar is to find uh, interested parties and partners who can walk this journey with us um, and we, I think we, we're here to help coordinate and make those linkages. So if you have, uh, if you do want us to contact you again, please just send a direct message to me and uh, drop out your, doc, your details so that we make sure we have them. Uh, over to you, Joe, for some additional questions. All right, thank you. Uh, I'd like to highlight a question here by uh, Charles who uh, is representing Rethread uh, Africa. This is one of the innovation champions with an interest in pineapple fiber. And the question is, uh, uh, how do we fix that missing piece of value addition? You talked about setting up the ready to spin facility in Vietnam. So I think you could highlight at what stage, what do we need to do to get to that level? Because this is the beginning of uh, the connections and the, but, you, but just to highlight that process where we would get from where we yeah. buy yes. 
Um, yeah, it, it's a it's a quite natural question, right? The, um, uh, it is good to actually establish an RTS uh, uh, facility um, because because the uh, when you have natural fi pineapple fiber or natural fiber, any kind of fiber that you have in, uh, let's say, in East Africa, you want to actually spin it in East Africa. You don't want to ship it all the way to Asia uh, to, to get it ready to spin it. And then after that, you, uh, you know, um, because the distance from Africa to Asia, there's a carbon footprint issue, right? You create carbon footprint uh, yeah, and uh, from a transportation. Now, I think the key thing is this. In order to have a facility, you need to have a scalable volume, consistent scalable volume, not erratic scalable volume. Because if it's erratic, factory will not work very well. So the, the important thing is, First, if we have a consistent scalable uh, volume, then obviously it makes sense to establish a RTS facility in uh, East, uh, East Africa. And you also make the cost cheaper. Why? Because you don't have to ship it all the way to Vietnam. You don't have to ship it all the way to somewhere else. Right? You actually make it in your own region, uh, which the local transportation cost will be much more lower. Yeah. So Harold, maybe just to follow up a bit. So when we say scale, how many tons of pineapple leaf are you talking per year, per day? Well, I think I think the um, well, there's going to be a lot of pineapple leaf. I I, I would think that um, if you want to do an RTS in uh, in East Africa, uh, you should not be doing just pineapple leaf fiber you should be doing uh, two or three different type of uh, natural fibers too. And uh, by doing this, then you will have sufficient skill, sufficient volume to, to do it. I do not think that uh, based on my knowledge, uh, this is purely my knowledge, based on my knowledge, uh, I don't think there'll be sufficient pineapple uh, uh, fiber to warrant uh, other TS facility. So Just give an example. Sorry? No, so I was asking, would it be something like cotton and pineapple or sisal pineapple and banana? Or yes, yes, like... yes. That, that, that is absolutely correct. We need to figure out um to set up one there where you can use uh where you can you can have two or three different kinds of uh fibers where you can turn it to RTS. Um, so there's two very interesting questions which I think we shouldn't overlook. Uh, the first one is from uh, Joanna Arantola Hatap, and she's asking, from the branding point of view, what is the current knowledge of pineapple fiber among the final consumers, customers, and users? And how is the final pricing compared to other natural fibers? So from the consumer's point of view, the customer. Well, from the branding perspective, Pineapple is actually very good. Uh, I'll tell you why. Why well, in one of the slides I showed you earlier, everyone loves pineapple in this world. Every, now, maybe I should rephrase it. Everyone knows pineapple, but most of them love pineapples. Right? And, um, and no shortage of people who have no knowledge. Even the Eskimo knows about pineapple. So, so in terms of awareness, in terms of a positive awareness, actually, uh, of pineapple is very high. So if you talk about pineapple fiber that make it into sustainable fashion, right? It, it's a wild thing. People will say, wow, how can this happen? I never knew of a pineapple fiber can make into, into fashions, can make into clothing, can make into shoes, you know, can use um or, or can use it in upholstery. So in the kind of excitement that you can see from people, right? Because pineapple is such a such a popular fruit, and uh, people know about it. So from the branding perspective, it's actually very good, right? Just to add on, right? If we talk about running and uh, using ham, ham is actually less well known, and it has some negative connotation, even though it's not true, but it has some negative connotation. If we use rami. Uh, you got to sell the. Uh, you got to explain very much. Uh, 
what is Rami? Rami is a natural fiber. Okay, natural fiber. Where's Rami? Where's Rami come from? And what how it, how it looks like? This is very difficult. Uh, it, it takes a lot of effort. Not impossible, but it takes a lot of effort. So when people talk about pineapple, you don't explain about pineapple. Okay, that's number one. Number two, price. What's the pricing? Pineapple fiber yield is very low compared to any of the natural fiber. So as a result, the cost of producing the natural fiber or pineapple fiber is actually very high. It's expensive. Right. So you uh, at this moment, pineapple fiber uh, positioning cannot be selling it in the mass market pricing. Meaning that if you make a product, let's say you make a pair of jeans, and if you want to sell uh, the pair of jeans with the pineapple fiber in it, uh, that jeans is unlikely to be at a mass market pricing. But because pineapple is such a nice name, and pineapple is such an intrinsic, uh, has this intrinsic value, um, you can actually position as a premium product, or you can position as an upper mass product, and people still love it. So if you compare yourself the products, you know, at a premium level, equal price in other premium products, no problem. Equal price in the upper mass market product, no problem. You know, I hope I answered the questions. I hope you did. Um, so there's one last one, which is a question around the time of growth of the pineapple leaf. And I think there was another question as well around when you actually harvest the leaf and that, that um, at what time do you harvest it? Is it when the fruit matures or can you harvest the leaf at the same time like um, you harvest the yeah. without compromising the quality of both? Normally you harvest the, the fruits first. And uh, when you finish the fruits, normally uh, you, you leave the leaf and the stems in the field to decompose for the next few months. And, uh, you know, and uh, but for our purpose, it's during this period, we send in the, well, the farmers or some of the workers that will be sent in to, uh, to harvest the leaf. It should be harvest, I think, if I'm not wrong, within the next two weeks. It can't take too long. If not, you will be dried up. Um, I'd like to highlight two questions. Mm -hmm. This is on the on the on the business side. Um, from purity, I'd like to know: Do you sell the yarns or fiber to the manufacturer? What's the business case? Once you have the fiber and the yarns, how do you handle it moving forward? That's number one. And the second one is, and a very critical question from an anonymous attendee, your collaboration with brands for you know, pineapple leaf fiber products. Yeah, we, we actually work with a number of brands. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we, we work, we, we've been talking to uh, more than 20 brands right now. Actually, more than 20. Um, and uh, many of them are in the different level of discussion. Um, some of them are already, some of them are at the testing stage. Some of them already completed the testing. Some of them wanted to pre already place an order, something like this. Um, so they're all at the different stages. All at different stages. And uh, you see, the whole thing is like this. The companies, uh, textile company, fashion companies, and fabric companies, they are all under this pressure for the brands to, uh, to, to find a more sustainable solution. And that's, why is that so? It is not because the consumer are demanding. Of course, consumer are demanding for something more sustainable. But it's also the companies, they also have their investors. The companies also need to have their image. And the company want to be seen uh, or some of them not just want to be seen, but truly want to be sustainable, right? And of course, some of them want to be seen sustainable. Uh, there are all different type of uh, companies in the, in the world. And, uh, and they need to build that. And consumer demand uh, is getting higher and higher on this. You know, I, I just want to let you know that some, some customers may say, uh, I may not buy the products from you, the sustainable product from you, because it's too expensive, or maybe your, your design is not nice. But if you do not do any sustainable product, I will never buy anything from you. 
even though uh, products are not sustainable, I won't buy from you because you are you do not do anything uh, sustainable. So especially with the Gen Z, especially with the uh, with the millennial, uh, they are the key drivers for all this. Right. So, but I, I cannot remember your first question. Can you repeat again, uh, Joseph? The other one was on the business side. Uh, do you sell fiber or yarn? Um, or are you involved in you do it yourself, actually processing it? So the business oh, side. Okay, of we yeah, we we actually I think the question is uh is also based on uh uh let me see, right, the slide I have. If we look at this slide here, uh, we we actually sell uh, number four, number five, number six. Meaning that we actually sell the, after, you know, when we become ready to spin, we actually sell this cottonized uh, fiber. And uh, if the customer prefer to buy from us the uh, branded yarn, we will we will appoint our OEM to do the branded yarn for us. We do not have a factory to do this, but we appoint uh uh, uh, spinners to do the branded yarn. And if a customer who are interested to buy fabric only, we will appoint an OEM to do the fabrics uh, and uh, for us so that we can sell to a customer. So base, basically is that uh, it all depends on what the customer wants. So uh, four, five, and six is what we sell to the customers. Uh, from the slide, you can see the slides, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, I'll highlight some, some technical uh, questions here. Uh, mm -hmm. This one must be textile practitioners. The first one is Kalayu, who is asking, what's the spinability? What do you explain about the spinability of the fiber? Which technology is appropriate? So that's number one. The second one is from uh, Enoch, who is asking about, you know, what's the process of cottonizing the fibers? Okay, spinability of the fiber. Uh, not all the spinners can spin into uh, into uh, into yarn because because there are many you know the natural fiber is not something very consistent, All right? And that's why it's called natural fibers. Um and. And many spinners in the world today, they they are very good in spinning things that are consistent, that spinning things that like, are uh, they used to do. So when they start touching on natural fiber, uh, some of them uh, may have a challenge to uh, to make it right. And frankly, we have that experience, we have that experience with many of the quite a few spinners that they tested and they failed. And at first they thought that our products no good. So what, what happened is that we had to go back to them and tell them that, okay, these are the basic things that you need to do. And uh, and some of them spin it again and they find out that they can do it better. So it's all about experience, right? It's all about the leaders and the, the needles of the, the spinning uh, that they use. And you know, also about the uh, the NE, you know, are you using NE20, NE15 or NE10, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, all these aspects that, uh, that they need to uh, to look at. Uh, one thing good about us is that we learn from for the last six months to nine months, we learn a lot from the spinners, and uh, we are coming out a menu. So every customer who buy products from us, we will give them a menu to tell them how can they spin it in a way, some basic menu, right? So spin it in a way that they will avoid and improve quality. I think that's the basic. So the second question is someone asking about how to cottonize the, the fiber. Ah, that process uh, is quite technical, even though it's a very easy process. If you have a fiber, before you make it to cottonize it or before you're going to bring it for spinning, first, you need to clean up the gum that stick onto the fiber. That's number one. Number two, fiber are kind of kind of uh, stick together. I mean, it's a one. you need to open up the fiber. That's number two. And number three, you need to chop, cut the fiber to the, to the you know, to the level of uh, size so that you can, uh, you know, it's not too long. You know, the size are cotton. 
So if we look at the cotton, cotton is actually open up already. That's why it looks like you know cotton line side. So you need to open it up. So these are the three processes I need to do. Basically. Um, Harold, a question here, which I think is quite intriguing, and it's uh, what is the outstanding or standout technical property of pineapple fiber? And uh, to add to that, if uh, you know, we've we've seen in the chat this mention of banana. We know in East Africa we've got a lot of capability in sisal, and then also in uh, coconut. Which one? Why? Why pineapple is probably is at the forefront, or which one would you say should be at the forefront in terms of its properties? Well, you know, uh, to start with, right, coconut cannot be used. Coconut, uh, the it is not appropriate. It's too thick and uh, cannot be used for for textile okay. application. Okay. Pineapple is uh is okay. Banana is thicker, but that doesn't mean that we cannot use banana and pineapple fiber can be used for textile application. Thank you. Um, I think you've answered a few of those uh, with that response. Um, so I think that we've covered pretty much everything. Um, oh yeah, there's one good one, uh, which is what is the average investment for a decorticator? You know, good question. Uh, it ranged between 1,200 US to 2,000 US dollar per decorticator. Yeah, that's the price in the market now. Okay, uh, we are uh, we have less than 10 minutes to go, so we will utilize this time um, in case there's any question Please check. Some have been answered directly. Some of the questions have been answered directly. And I think you have been emphasizing on this aspect of building uh, partnerships. Perhaps this could be an opportunity to uh, elaborate on how you want to go through the process of establishing uh, partnerships within East Africa. Quite a number of uh, interests have been expressed. And uh, we believe this is not the end. There will be many individual conversations, but you could speak from your perspectives on how you've done it in other countries. I mean, I actually miss some of your, your what you say. Yes, I'm, I'm just saying uh, there has been a couple of interests expressed in, uh -huh. the, in the, the chat about partnerships. Uh -huh. And my suggestion is maybe you could use an example uh, how would you want to go about it in East Africa? Of course, there will be follow-up conversations, but what I, what would be the most successful approach based on how you've done it in other countries? Yeah, I think I think this uh, important thing is this, right? The uh, number one is is uh, creating awareness and education to let the farmers know that there's an opportunity for them to make extra income. You'd be surprised that many of these people doesn't know about it, right? And uh, and number two is that you need to form up. Someone has to 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 work on helping the farmers to form the uh, the farmers group, or or if it's a little bit more formalized, it'll be a cooperative. And uh, and this group will be able to work with the farmers. And farmers can become a member of this group or become a cooperative, and then they can. They can work with them and they deliver the leaf to the cooperative. They do the decortication and cooperative. We can train them. We can send someone to train them. And then we can offtake the products from them. All, right. uh, all this process uh, will take a while. It's not so easy. Um, but we cannot go to, to a corporate uh, to a farmer's group right, where their volume is not sufficient. So we need we normally need to work with someone that is uh, you know, on the average basis, able to produce uh, one ton, one ton of uh, pineapple leaf fiber. That should be the, uh, the minimum. 800 kg a month 
maybe it's okay, but it's it's actually quite tough. If you can do one ton a month, month I think that would be uh, helpful because uh, size is important. And one ton is not a lot, but if the yield is 1.8%, you know how much is the pineapple leaf that to collect? There's a lot of pineapple leaf that to collect. So the uh, uh, we we this is not easy. Uh, we need to do a proper workout. We need to come up with the operating models, which we already have. Uh, but the operating model has to. Uh, I don't think it's one size fit it all. Uh, I think if we go to East Africa, uh, it will be slightly different on the model. And um, yeah, I think that's that's the the key, right? And and again, uh, next Devo is very far away. We are we are located in Southeast Asia, so if we if we want to work with someone or someone want to work with us, we need to have basically someone in East Africa to coordinate together with us, uh, to make this uh, happen and make it successful. Um, Harold, last one was uh, there was a request actually from one of the attendees whether it's possible to visit uh, with you in Southeast Asia and have a look at your operation. Um, we would definitely be excited to take out a few people to have a look if they're interested, but are we welcome? Yeah, sure. I think I think uh, we can organize that. Uh, if uh, if a group of them wants to come over, you know, for, for learning and we are willing to share the uh, best practices, uh, sharing how things is done here. Um, I think uh, probably not for the next two months. Uh, we have to. We can. We can work out a timeline. But this this few months, we are going to be extremely busy. Hey, um, hey. yes, thank you. Before we invite you for your closing um, remarks, uh, I just wanted to highlight that we we welcome any feedback, and uh, Adriana from Next Table will post a link. Uh, well, you, you could just click on it and share your feedback on this particular webinar. But this, as we have said, is not the end. We are hoping it's the beginning of these conversations and hopefully linkages will develop out of this. We are here to support these connections as much as uh, possible. So that QR, uh, uh, which is being displayed right now, is your link to the feedback. So I will welcome our closing remarks. We will start with uh, Harold, then we'll close with Antoinette. Yeah, I think it's a pleasure of uh, to spend uh, two sessions uh, with uh, you know, together with Gatsby, Gatsby and this program. Uh, I'm actually quite happy to share you know the first program. Uh, for some of you may also attend the first one, and also the second program here. Uh, in regards to the all natural fibers as well as the pineapple uh, fiber uh, uh, for this session. And I hope that um, in this sharing, uh, we can create some excitement uh, and create awareness in regards to opportunity to go into this uh, business. Uh, this is not just only uh, for environment, but it's also for the social. And obviously, uh, it will help uh, both sides. You know, environmental impact is very important, but for uh, East Africa, um, um, having an opportunity to make incremental income is also important. Uh, I hope that these two sessions will be useful for, for the attendees. All right. Uh, over to you, Antoinette, to close. Yes. Uh, so thank you so much to everyone who has attended. This was definitely an exciting session. Really glad to see all the questions and um, and to those who want to take the conversation further, we're excited to uh, engage with you. Um, one thing that we recognize as a as a program is that uh, whilst Harold is bringing expertise and um, opportunities from Asia and, and learning points, there's also quite a lot of work that is already underway within East Africa by businesses, some of them represented here today. So we'll be more than happy to uh, extend this series of webinars to showcase what others are doing, uh, just to also bring awareness of what is happening in our region. And uh, to us, this is a very exciting opportunity in terms of alternative fibers. Uh, we think that there's, an, there's, a, there's a real case here 
for East Africa to position itself as a production hub. Uh, we have the natural uh, material already here going to waste in our farms. So please, um, we, we, we are not here just to do webinars. We're here to advance the conversation into a credible business model with the ultimate aim to uh, be shipping out apparel made of these alternative fibers out of East Africa in the next five years. So reach out to us, uh, please give us your feedback. And if we think your business deserves or has what you know should be showcased here uh, alongside us, like as we did next level, please uh, reach out to us and we will organize together. And Harold, we've heard you loud and clear in terms of planning a visit. So we won't disturb you in the next two months, but if we have enough uh, interest, we hope to see you sometime in the beginning of next year. So thanks everyone. And thanks to the team for organizing it. So there's a lot of work that happens in the background uh, to get this out, to, to get this kind of events going. So to my team and the team, um, in comms, uh, thank you for the support and enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the week. Bye-bye.